Let's have a word of prayer, and then I want to I want to take a look at the Eucharist idea. Remember, to have prayer with me, you need to be have your sins confessed. Mental attitude type, sins of the tongue overt. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. And so, our Heavenly Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way to study with us the Word of God. Listen, we're a nation with trouble, but I don't know if there's ever a time we're not. I mean, in the world, you will have tribulation. Be of good courage. I've overcome the world. So we pray for our nation. We pray for the church within it that can bring great structure and foundational ideas to the America. The foundation, what is the foundation of America? It's Jesus Christ. Then the Constitution. Because <laughs> we see what people will do with the Constitution. We have a great opportunity as a church of the Lord Jesus Christ to be evangelical with people streaming across our borders, Father, to, to enter into America that other people are discontent with, they would be happy as a lark to be a part of. And most of them come from countries that teach God, but they don't teach a clear gospel. Raise up, Father, an army from this side of the border that can carry the gospel of Jesus Christ to the border and do missionary work as these people come to our land. I pray for the Bell family and for Keith that he might be a strong witness at this time for other members of the family and we would be here for him as well as anyone else that loves us and for the ladies of the Lord what a great ministry this is that you've raised up these ladies at least in this perimeter do a phenomenal job and I'm so thankful for that leadership and for that ministry that has gone internationally and for Rick what a great ministry he has been placed with responsibility of I pray for him Gary Horton this great truckers ministry it's an enormous idea for open doors people in our church that are still sick still struggling with things in their life for those father in our family that will be moving like the Owens what a bright light they've been to us. What an encouragement. I pray as you send them as missionaries to another place that they will serve just as wholeheartedly for Christ as they have with us. They will be sorely missed. But like in everything else in life, Father, they pass through to go on to greater things, and we're thankful for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Here's my idea for the month. Daylight savings time. That's next Sunday, isn't it? Day, daylight saving time. I, I want to break those down into two ideas. Saving time and daylight. Second Corinthians, the sixth chapter, talks about saving time. If you'd look at that with me for a moment. Verse 1 and 2. And working together with him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Then he quotes Isaiah. That's his proof text because that was his Bible. And he, he does Isaiah 49, 8. And it's interesting. When you go home later today and, 
are thinking around, you ought to le read Isaiah 49, 8. Not now, because I, I don't want to spend that much time on it, but it will serve you well to look at what Paul did with it. And so he took a proof text out of Isaiah 49, 8, and, and, and wrote, At the acceptable time I listened to you, and on the day of salvation I helped you. Listen to how Paul, Paul broke it down. Paul broke it down. Behold, now is the acceptable time. What, look at the word behold. Behold, now is the day of salvation. See how he broke that down? Look how he broke that down. He took that, he took that verse and he broke it down in two ideas with the word behold. Now is the acceptable time. That's the first part of the verse. The behold, the second part, now is the day of salvation. Look what Paul did. He, he took something out of, out of Old Testament ancient history and brought it into the modern day life of the church. And today is the time. Look, he used the word now for the word time, with the idea of time. Now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. And I find that really interesting on the idea of today. I took an old a passage that goes hundreds of years back, th thousands, and for us, and brings it into the modern day need of people. There is a time of salvation. It's always today. It's not yesterday, and it's not tomorrow. The, and listen, the word today means urgency. The urgency. So if it's the time of salvation, why do I need it? Well, we need it because all men, listen, if, if you're part of humanity, if you're a human, not a dog or a cat or a bird, a fish, if, if you're humanity, if you're part of humanity, if you're a human being, then your ancestral father is Adam. When you read the genealogy of Luke, the third chapter, everything starts with Adam and goes to Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 15, 45, the first Adam of Genesis, he's called the first Adam, and Jesus is called the last Adam. The first Adam got the human race in a mess, and the last Adam resolved it. When Adam and Eve partook of the tree of knowledge of good and evil and ate, they died. They didn't die at that, at that moment physically, but they did spiritually. And 950 years later, the, Adam is going to die physically. Dying you will die was the, was the charge of, of if you eat of the tree, dying you will die. He died spiritually and he died physically. And that set the, that set the whole stage for the human race. All men are born in Adam, are born physically, spiritually, physically alive and spiritually dead. And it has to be resolved before they die physically. Because spiritual death in life means you're separated from God in time. If you die in that state, you will be separated from God in eternity. You should read Romans, the fifth chapter, 5. Verses 12 through 21. In Adam all die. Therefore, as in one man, all have sinned and they die spiritually. And so you have to be, man has to be rescued. Colossians 1.13. You have to be rescued from Adam, your position in Adam, your which are the 13 judicial charges of Adam's sin, one of them is perishing. Listen to John 3.16, right? You, can, you know that, don't you? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever 
would believe in him would not, what's the word? Perish, but have eternal life. You see, every person born in Adam under one of the 13 judicial charges is perishing. That's without God in time. And if you die that way, it will be that way in eternity. Perishing, what a terrible state. When you talk about the human body perishing, it's under corruption and dying. But you see, you can be transferred through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ to the gospel. You can be transferred into Christ. Where is eternal life? Eternal life is the answer to perishing, eternal perishing. The answer is eternal life. How do I get eternal life? I have to believe the gospel of Christ. I'm baptized into Christ. Into Christ, I am no longer perishing. That's done. I'm in the last Adam, eternal life. That's true with all the 13 judicial charges. I was dead, now I'm alive. I was blind, and now I see. I was in darkness, now I'm in light. You see? So you have to realize that you're born in a state of need of salvation. You can't rescue yourself. Jesus is the only way. John 14, 6, Jesus said it really clear. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father except through me. You see, today is the day of your salvation. I don't know how long you've been. I don't know what your birth date is, but I know that if you have not believed the gospel of Jesus Christ up to now, today is the day you should do it. I know that for sure. Today's the day you should do that. What do I have to do to be saved, Ron? You've got to believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. When you believe it, the gospel is the power of God to save you, Romans 1.16. The gospel is the power of God to save you. So there is a need in all men to be saved today. You say. No man can come to the Father except through Jesus. And unless you're with the Father, you're still in that state. In, you're still in Adam. The only way you can be in God is through Christ. If you're in Christ, you're in God. And if you're not in Christ, you're not with God. I, I can't tell it to you any clearer. Today is the day of salvation. This is what Paul is saying. Today, now, now, you got to got to watch. You got to. I guess nobody has watches anymore. You got a cell phone. Today is the day. Religion can't do it. Going to church is a good thing, but it won't save you. You know. So he he says. This is the day of salvation, right? Daylight saving time, all right? I want you to go to Ephesians for the other half of that. The fifth chapter in verse 8. Daylight, daylight saving time. We dealt with saving time. Let's deal with daylight. You were formerly darkness. That's in Adam. You're alienated, darkness, death, you know. Darkness, spiritual darkness. 2 Corinthians 4, 3 and 4. You don't, you don't have the eyes to see. Listen, not only, listen. This is why unbelievers don't realize anything. They're both blind and, listen, they're, bo they're both blind and in darkness. And God mentions these are two different things. In the 13 judicial charges, not only are you, are you blind, but you're in darkness. Think about that. That's about as dark as it would get, wouldn't it? Listen, there's one darkness that will eat those two up like nothing, and that's to die without God. Listen, what he says, you were formerly, meaning that they had believed the gospel and had been rescued out of Adam and placed into Christ. You were formerly darkness, 
Look at this. But now, see, there's that word now again. But now, see, you and I live in the now in Christ. Not the former years. Stop living your life out of the former days. Well, I was such a, I did, oh, my, I don't want to hear about it. The former, former days are former days. They're not now. Live your life now in Christ. Stop looking back over your shoulder at how you could have done it better. Do it better now. Stop looking over your shoulder. For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. He took your darkness and gave you the light. Ephesians 1.18, you know, your eyes, the inner eyes of light in God. You are, you are light in the Lord. Walk, as Perry Patel, walk as children of the light. Daylight saving time. Okay? Maybe we ought to start doing that today. Wouldn't that be good? Well, let's go into our lesson. One more time, let's go to Ephesians. Not, not Ephesians, Thessalonians. My Bible is, I think Al said the other day, your Bible's falling apart. Well, as long as my Bible and not me, it'll be all right. Oh, gosh, yeah. Thanks, Rick. I want to do Eucharist. That's, I did this whole thing to do Eucharist. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 11. Thank you. I, my engine started. Yes, we want to do the Eucharist. That's what that whole thing was about. For us to do the Eucharist. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three. 23. He says, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night he was, that he was betrayed, he took bread and, when, and having taken bread, he, thank, he, ga he gave thanks and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you do in remembrance of me. So we're going to do that first. Uh, let's go ahead and get our bread. Our bread. I'm going to wait just a minute for her to get her bre bread. Remember, this represents his body. As he said, this is my body, which is for you, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Remember, what, what we're doing is in remembrance of him, his body that bore our sins on his body on the cross. It has to be virgin birth, hypostatic union, undiminished deity, and true 100% God, 100% man. He's got to be impeccable. He who knew no sin became sin for me, that I might become the righteousness of God in him. He do that. And remember that he's seated at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, everything that he is, we are. That's by the grace of God. So let's go ahead and take this. You ready? And let's give thanks to the Lord. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we've come to understand the importance of what the bread represents in the Eucharist. That it represents the body that was broken on my behalf by divine judgment for my sin. Uh, words could never express the true gratitude. The more we study about that the greater the grace is in my life. I'm so thankful.
that in your wisdom, you, you brought him into the human race to solve the Adamic problem by the virgin birth, that he lived an impeccable life all the way to the cross and surrendered his will in the final day to the divine will. What a great lesson for us as followers of Christ. I want to thank you this March, Father, for all that you've run through our lives because you saw us worthy, even if we didn't ourselves. Thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll take the cup. And he said, in the same way he took the cup also, and after supper said, this cup is the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often as drink it in remembrance of me. The remembrance of me is to take the blood of Christ to a place of doctrinal theology, what does it represent to my life now? What's the blood of Christ on the cross represent to me now in Birmingham, Alabama in March of 21? Well, their standard, there are nine things that the blood of Christ secured for you that will always be there no matter where you are in your life with Christ. And things like regeneration and redemption, propitiation, justification, sanctification. The great victory over sin in our life. I'm, I'm appreciative in my life that I can go back to the cross as a believer when I've committed volitional sin in my life against God and knew it when I was doing it and did it anyhow, whether it be in a mental attitude sin or a sin of the tongue or an avert sin, and know that I still, because I'm a child of God under the blood of Jesus Christ, has a right to come back to the cross as a believer and confess my sins and be cleansed from it. That's what I'm thankful about when I take part in this. I'm, I'm thankful that the blood of Christ secured me well enough for me as a believer to understand the privilege I have to return to the cross. And listen, when you confess your sin, if you visualize you're at the cross and Christ is suffering for the sins that you're committing volitionally ought to bring a sober thought to your life. It does to me. I said it to, I kneel at the cross and say, what is wrong with me, Father, that I can't see to get a handle on this? And the Holy Spirit's responsibilities tell me. Now, often he tells you, and he tells you in some ways that you don't like. Most of the times I don't. Because he pulls back the layer of pretense in our life and says, look, this is why. So for me, I don't think so much about the nine things anymore. I run them through my mind because I think I'm responsible for that. To understand the privilege I have to go to the cross, that I am the redeemed of God. I'm a child of God. And he allows me the privilege. But the word cleanse in 1 John 1, 9 takes me back to the cross. Because it's the blood of Christ that deals with sin, whether it's personal or Adamic. But what, how it affects my life now that I think that way is I find myself kneeling at the cross of Christ, weeping over the sins I've committed volitionally when I should not have. 
And the Holy Spirit will work with a guy like that or a gal like that. He will work with you. He'll pull back the superficiality that you're living and say, look, clean it up, Baba. Come on. You can walk in the spirit, not the flesh. You can walk by faith and not by sight. What's wrong with you? Come on. We've got a job to do. Come on. See, for me, when I read this, that's how I see it. Now, it's important that you see the nine works of Christ on the cross, what the blood did for your life. Because it gives you a deep appreciation when you come back to the cross and confess your sins to him. It gives you an appreciation for who and what he is in your life. I'm just telling you how it affects my life. Here we go. This is the cup of the new covenant of my blood. Do this as often you drink it in remembrance of me. Then he goes on to give us an assurance as often you drink. Eat the bread and drink the cup. You claim the Lord's death till he comes. Thank you, Lord. Boy, does he not tell us what we should be doing from this Eucharist to the next Eucharist? What's he tell you to do? Huh? Yeah, that's right. Proclaim, proclaim, the, proclaim the message. You know, go back to your journal and look at it. See how many, how many people you document in it that you're praying for that need your prayers. And ask the Lord if there's any way that I could send them a note or give them a call on the phone or text them. Put that in my heart that I might know how to do that. If there's a way that I can touch that person's life, then show that to me. A lot of ways to proclaim the Lord, isn't there? But you should be proclaiming them. It shouldn't be just in a mirror. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, that's personal sin unconfessed will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. He'll be disciplined, as Paul later says. Let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For who, he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself. That's why it's always God's will, not mine, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are being disciplined, weak sickness, number sleep, have died. If we judge ourselves rightly, 1 John 1, 9, we should not be judged. Why? Because the judgment, listen, you're always back at the cross. And God has already judged the cross. You're always back at the cross. By your confession of sin, you're back at the cross, and the cross has judged your sins. It's not a sin issue. It's a Christian life issue. Your personal sin are issues in the way you're managing your Christian life. My, 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 people, come on. It's not the first day you've been to class. When we are judged, we are disciplined. That's the point. All right. Now let's go to our lesson. First Thessalonians, the second chapter. Let's go back to Thessalonians. I don't know. First Thessalonians, second chapter. I'm in verses 14 through 16. You remember I broke the second chapter down by Paul's method at least in my opinion, because I always look for markers when Paul writes. That's just my method. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea. For you also endured the same sufferings at the hand of your own countrymen, even as they did from the Jews. The Christian church in, in Judea was suffering greatly for the cause of Christ. Paul takes the gospel to, the Th to Thessalonica, Thessalonica, and the Thessalonian church is suffering by their own countrymen. 
should it surprise you if we're not suffering for the cause of Christ by our countrymen? What, what makes you any different in the church of Jesus Christ? Well, apparently you think there is. Who both killed, who both killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and drove us out. They are not pleasing to God, but hostile to all men. Pay attention to that word both, because you missed it. 16, hindering us, drove us out, hostile all men, hindering us from preaching to the Gentiles that they might be saved, with the result that they always fill up the measure of their sins. Isn't that an interesting idea? One day I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to teach that to you. Always fill up the measure of their sins. I mean, who's taking measurements? Who's weighing the balance? <laughs> How about that? Somebody's, somebody's weighing the balance, right? Nah. Don't you always worry that God is not in control. Don't ever worry about, well, whoever's in charge is in charge. Let's not tell you who's in charge, God. But raft has come upon them to the utmost. Now I want to focus today on this word suffering. Back in verse 14. For you also endure the same sufferings. There's an interesting word for suffering in the Greek language. It's pasco. That's a verbal form or paska. If it's got an A on the end, it's a noun. If it has an O on the end, it's a verb. But here's what's interesting about this. This word, suffering, by the Greek word pascha, pascha, is the word pascha lamb. The pascha lamb, the pa Passover lamb. Pascha is Passover. It's dealing with the Passover lamb. The Exodus 12 story. Oh, you need to be familiar with Exodus 12. I don't have time to teach it all to you today. I've taught it to you many times. But when you deal with the Passover and unleavened bread, you've got to read the foundation doctrine is Exodus, the 12th chapter. The first half of the chapter deals with the Passover and verses 15 and so deal with unleavened bread and they're two different units of holidays. They're two different holidays that have been pushed into an eight-day festival. Well, you really need to know that because j just to get in a moment, I'll give you an example of that. Um, Mark 14, 12. Now, I don't want you to go there now, but I want you to circle it, read it later. Oh, go ahead. Just go ahead. I'll probably never get through anyhow, so. I don't know. I'm... I'm so time-oriented, except when I get in the pulpit. I don't have any control of this stuff anyhow. 14, 12. I want to show you something. I'm going to show you something. The reason Exodus 12 is important. 12th chapter, verse 14. Now, I've been doing recent studies on this, so if you've kept current, this ain't going to be a new, new deal to you, but I got Mark... Mark 14, what did I say? Mark 14, 12. And I went to 12, 14, which I have to watch myself. I do that all the time. I have that, whatever it is. On the, on the, he says, on the first day of unleavened bread, when, Paso when the Passover lamb was being sacrificed, his disciples said to him, uh, where do you want us to go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? You know what he just did? He called the eight-day, they call, Mark called the eight-day festival unleavened bread. He's not using it technically, he's using it generically. You say, how do you know that, Ron Adema? Because I read Exodus 12, congregation. And if you read Exodus 12, you'll see there's a difference between Passover on the 14th of Niacin and unleavened bread from 15 to 21. 
you have to understand when you read the Gospels and you're dealing with Passover, sometimes they use Passover to deal with the first day, and sometimes they deal, deal with it. Sometimes they'll say Passover mean eight days. Some days they'll say unleavened bread and mean eight days. You understand that? Well, you better. Because here's a passage that will really screw your head up. I guess. <laughs> or, or mess it up. Okay? Now, I just mentioned that because you got the idea of Passover. Now, in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, let's go there. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, because this is important to the word, this suffering is unique. It's, the, it's your identity with the suffering of Christ for sin. Your identity. For 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 1 Corinthians 5, I don't know. 1 Corinthians 5. 7. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Now, this is really interesting how he does this. He says, clean out the, clean out the old leaven that you may be a new lump just as you are, in fact, unleavened for Christ, our Passover also has been sacrificed. Now, you really have to understand the, the Jewish festival of Passover and unleavened bread. You really have to understand that, that Jesus Christ dies during that time. He's buried for three days. He's raised from the dead, yada, yada. You really have to understand that whole process because Paul just lumped it up into one verse. And boy, was that interesting verse. Wow. What he just said to you right there is, wow. But he used our word that's important to us in 5-7 when he said, for Christ, our Passover has been sacrificed. It's the word sacrificed. He used it in the most phenomenal way. John the Baptist said it in John 1-29 when he said, behold, the Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world. Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. That was the same idea. Or 1 Peter 1, 18, when he talks about the lamb unblemished without spot, he's talking about the same thing. It's just, it's just interesting. Paul's just a really interesting. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 19. It's just interesting. Now let's look at a few ideas on this idea of the Christian suffering under Pascha. That is being identified with the suffering of Christ for the sins of the world. And listen, there's a lot of categories of undeserved suffering. This is one of them. Suffering for, this, for the cause of Christ, for, for proclaiming the gospel to other people. There are many categories in it. Before, the, before his salvation, Saul of Tarsus, known as Paul, was one, of the, was one of the hands of apostate Jews that was used to persecute the church of Jesus Christ. I say that because I'm always amazed at what God, what, who God can save and what he can save him for. That amazes me and amazed everybody in the early Christian church. It amazed him that this man that was so hostile to the church of Jesus Christ was saved and was now declaring himself inside the church to be accepted. And they were having a really hard time with it. But it's because this guy was, was putting in prisons their mother and father and brothers and sisters and children. You can understand they were having a real struggle because he represented the enemy of the church. And they were afraid that he was disguising himself to get inside to get put more people in prison. And Paul really had a, t a time uh, in his early Christianity from chapter 9 to 13 in the book of Acts. He's in a struggle. And there were certain Christians that were phenomenal that stood up for Paul like Barnabas and Saul. Ananias. There were certain people that just saw 
a changed life and a heart for God. But they were hesitant to work with him at the beginning. It just amazes me. It just amazes me. At one time, he was the hands of the apostate Jews that killed Stephen. At the death of Stephen, these, these apostate Jews laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. That's like passing the baton to the next runner that they think can win the heat. My, my, my. That was in Acts 57, 58. In Acts 8, 1. And on that day, when they killed Stephen and laid their robes at the foot of a warrior for them, on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. And the next thing you read is now Paul, Saul, Saul of Tarsus, was, threat, was breathing threat and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked for letters from him, watch this now, to the synagogue at Damascus. They fled, and he's fleeing after them. He's not content to rid them from Jerusalem. He wants to rid them from the face of the earth. How would you like to have been part of that church community? And wherever you ran, he ran after you. Like a Jezebel. They, they ran, and he ran after them. That's what he's saying. So that if he found any belonging to the way, that's John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come to the Father except through me. Belonging to the way, both men and women, that he might bring them bound back to Jerusalem. So God had an encounter. The Lord Jesus Christ encountered him in Acts 9. And boy, did he ever encounter him. In Galatians, the first chapter, verse 13, Paul talks about his former manner of life. <laughs> Listen, God bless you, people. Do you, you have a former way of life? Keep it over there. Stop bringing it into your now presence. You got a former life? Make it former. Cut your losses. Cut your losses and get out of it. Or your former life will be drugged in every day. You'll be living your former life, your former life, your former life. Your former life needs to be a former life. You're not going to move on with the Lord until you get rid of the former life. You've got to accept that's a former life. I'm not going to buy into any more of it. I'm not going to deal with it anymore. I'm not going to have anything to do with it because it's not the will of God. It, none of that is the will of God. I've got saved from it. I'm not going to deal with it. I'm going to separate myself from it. I'm done with it. That's called the former life, people. It ain't former if it's still present. You know, I have a former life as a high school person, college person, football player. These are former lives. I don't do any of that anymore. I'm not going to go back to high school. I'm not going to go back to college. Well, I don't need another bachelor's degree. Why would I do that? I can buy a book. I learned that all I do is paying to read books. I can do that. I'm going to read. My former manner of life, when I persecuted beyond measure the church, Beyond measure. Beyond measure. That's Paul's testimony. Point two. Once again, Paul brags on the church of Thessalonica for being imitators of the Pascha suffering for Christ, even as they, the Jewish believers, did from their Jewish countrymen. The church of Thessalonica are now suffering by their countrymen. Sound like a pattern? 
Why should you expect anything less, my church? Why would we expect anything less than what the church has suffered throughout all the centuries? Point number two. Once again, Paul brags on this church two groups who were under Pascha suffering for Christ in the church. One group was out preaching the gospel and being persecuted, and the other groups were those who were becoming believers and being united with the church of Jesus Christ and were being persecuted as a member of the church. You know who a member of the church is? One who shows up in assembly. <laughs> because you are the church. You don't go to church. You are the church. The church comes together. It's called the ecclesia. They assemble together. You know all that, don't you? Wonderful story about Ananias. And when God sp said to Ananias, I got a guy. I he needs to be mentored. I want you to dis disciple him. He said, well, what's his name? He says, Saul of Tarsus. He says, uh, you ought to pass him on to somebody else. Give him to Ron Adema. Give him to somebody else. Listen, I, I would hope that I would always be ready to take that guy. How about a Horton? Somebody took us, didn't they? Somebody took us. They didn't look at our past to take us. They looked at our presence. Our declaration that we had come to know Christ and just wanted to know more about him. Ananias took Paul, and what a great day in the life of Paul was that Ananias responded to the will of God and not to his own. In his own will, he didn't want to do it, but the father said, my will is to do it. He said, I, I surrender to your will. That's the name of the game, people. Every day of our life, that's what we go through. Is this God's way? What you're doing and where your heart is. Is your heart where the will of God is or with your heart? Listen, where your heart is always should be where the will of God is. When you put your heart where the will of God is, your heart's always going to get hurt. If you put your heart where God's will isn't, your heart's always going to be hurt. Oh, please, please, I want to spare you that. I want to spare you that. It's never going to work because God has something better. You got to understand that. The grace program is the most amazing program. Later, Paul will use his personal testimony of his experience of conversion and the influence of Ananias upon his life to, to declare equal apostolic status with the rest of the apostles of Christ. He does that in Galatians chapter 1 and 2. Third, Pascha suffering for Christ is the Norman standard for all Christians during the church age. If you think that somehow you deserve to be spared from this, read Philippians 1.29. Here's what it says. For to you, see that word you? You can write your name there. You ought to make that personal. For to Ron Adema, I know you could write my name there. <laughs> ah, yeah. Write your name there. For to you, it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also. See that word, not only, but also? You ought to circle that. Not only, but also. To suffer Pasco, that's the verbal form for his sake. It's been granted for Christ's sake. For you to suffer for Christ's sake. Had, do you believe that Jesus died for your sins and was raised from the dead? Right? That's the, uh, you believe that? Okay. Guess what's, on, guess, what's on, guess what's up next? Maybe not next right away because God doesn't do it to baby believers. That's no excuse to stay there, though. Because you'll get caught in a group. Not as an individual. You'll get, you get suffering collectively. These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. 
listen, any given day in your life, when your life is upset, emotionally upset, whatever, things aren't going the way I thought they would go. I was so sure that this was going to be. You have no peace. You know what you have? You have no peace about it. You have no peace about it. You know what you have? Instead of peace, you know what you have? You always have this. If you don't have peace, you have what? You have tribulation. Tribulation. In Christ, in his will, there's peace. It's a peace that passes all understanding. When you don't have that, you're all upset. Things ain't going the way you thought. You know what you got? You got tribulation. You know why you got tribulation? Because you went to the world rather than Christ. You went to the world. The world, you can get nothing else from the world but tribulation. Well, I was just telling you, I didn't write it. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation. Take courage. I have overcome the world. See, there's a better day for you. Not where you are. You're not in a good place in your life right now. You can change that. You're the only one that can change. The only person who can change your life right now is you. You should always be in a place where you can always have peace no matter what, how the world's treating you. No matter what's flowing through your life is to bring you always to a place where you always have peace in God. Well, you should study the fruit of the Spirit again in Galatians 5, 22, 23. Anytime your heart gets all messed up, I don't know what that is. I just thought I was so sure about this. This time I was sure. I don't know how many times we've all said that. Listen, what you ought to do, and your heart's all messed up. That's okay. Look, that's part of it. It's how you resolve it. It's how you resolve it. Go to Galatians. For the, right off the bat, you should go to Galatians. When your heart's all messed up, you should go to Galatians 5, 22, 23. It talks about nine fruit. Pick out one you need to eat. It's okay. You can eat from that tree. Well, I need some joy. I need some peace. You can look at those and say, what do you need? And the Holy Spirit will give it to you. Boom, just like that. Right? It's called walking in the Spirit. If you walk in the Spirit, you have the fruit of the Spirit. Listen, when your heart gets all out of joy, it's, it's just part of the human, the human life. Your heart gets out of joy. Go to that Galatians and, and say, what do you need? And the Spirit of God will put it in your heart. That's what I do. That's exactly what I do. I go get me some fruit. <laughs> I want a piece of cake. I'd like a great big bowl of ice cream with a lot of gobbledygook on it. Let's just. But I go for fruit. Because I know it's better for me. I go to the fruit of the spirit. I have never find it. Not one time in my life has it failed me. Not one time. Not one time. Just go eat some fruit. <laughs> eat the fruit of the Spirit. That is. Point four. Now I have to close. I never can get all done. What's going on here? Jewish apostate religion killed their prophets sent to preach the message of grace, salvation, and Christ. They refused because they went to the law. And Paul writes the book of Acts, the book of Romans, and the book of Galatians to warn the church. When they murdered their only, one and only Messianic Savior, 
the parable of the vine grower of Luke 20, well worth your read, 9 through 18. A portion of that parable. And when the vine gr grower saw him, the son of the owner, they reasoned with one another saying, this is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance will be ours. That's Jesus talking about himself to an apostate religious group of people called Jews. Let us kill him so that his inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Question. What then will be the owner of the vi what will the owner of the vineyard do to them? Answer. He will come and destroy those vine growers and will give their vineyards to others. And he did. It's called 70 AD, fifth cycle of divine discipline. To Rome. Now he speaks to Thessalonica, Paul does in 1 Thessalonians. You also endure the same suffering. He would speak that to our hearts if he was here today in person. Yeah, that's enough. You can read the last one. Let's close in a word of prayer. I want to thank all those that came with us to visit with us today, both by the internet and the automobile. You need to take to heart this message. On Wednesday, I've started a new series based on Matthew 24, 37 through 39. I'm taking all my lessons out of Genesis 6, 7, 8, 9, entitled The Days of Noah. He said, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be like in the days of the Son of Man. I think it would be well worth our study to go through that for what our nation is in, what the church is involved with in the nation of America. So that's my Wednesday study. John, or whoever that is back there. Oh, okay, let's pledge in. John wants a minute. I pray and then we're going to pledge. Then John. All right. Father, we're so thankful for the freedom that we have today. And maybe what we see at our border is a great opportunity for the church of Jesus Christ. Like in other type of crises, a wind storm comes through or an ocean, hurricanes. We send people immediately Maybe this would be a great opportunity, especially for those who can speak Spanish. Thank you for the, the day that we've had today, Father, together. And the prayers that we mentioned prior, we bring them back to restate them and ditto uh, in our closing thoughts. In Jesus' name, amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, visible, with liberty and justice for all. If you'll be seated, John, had, John would not take long. Oh, remember... You got saved. Yeah. October the 20th, uh, October the 18th, 1960. Wow. Sorry, by name, any of you know this. Sorry, by the name of Ray Alexander. Introduced me to the gospel. I was 24. And I believed it. And I was made alive. I knew it. Wow. I didn't, I knew it. Didn't understand what happened, but I knew I was alive. Right.
pray, took me down to Saigon. And there was a missionary conference going on, Christian Missionary Alliance. And they had missionaries all over the country, in the country, that gathered. And Ray introduced me and said, John here just accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as earthly sin. Folks, they went nuts. <laughs> Hey, wow! And all over. Never forget. Amazing. The weeks go. 20th. February 20th. Jarvis. Thomas. Walked into our prayer ministry. Seeking assistance. Sat himself down across the board. No. <laughs> In a moment. A few moments. Horton shared the gospel with him. Jarvis accepted Christ. Yes. I didn't buy it. That Jarvis name. And I would ask all of you. Yes. Who's Ron Jarvis? <laughs> 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 I don't hear about that. Yes. God love you, buddy. God love you.